Uh, I'll give you three or four minutes for this. Okay, this is your quiz question. I want you to do it uh, in about three minutes or something. I'm giving you two signals. One of them is the input, and the other one is the impulse response, H of N. This is a linear and uh, time invariant system you may think of. And I want you to find the output, which is the convolution of X and H. <coughs> Be careful uh, about H. You may start by plotting H accurately first. As you see, it's 1 for n is equal to 0 and 2. And it's minus 1 for n is equal to 1 and 0 as well. So first plot it, and then whichever method you may think of for uh, convolution, it may be flipping around and sliding, or it may be a uh, system response approach. <coughs> Just do it the way that you want. <coughs> OK. <coughs> Uh, we will collect. Okay, so let's start now. <coughs> uh, today I'll continue with the continuous time counterparts of the uh, of all the things about the linear and time invariant systems that we have been doing. So instead of uh, x of n now, I will continue with x of t coming into an LTI system. And this is going out. <coughs> now, um, the uh, strategy will be similar. Instead of x of t, we will apply an impulse again. And we will measure, measure the, the uh, response, which is, again, notated in a similar manner, h of t which is called impulse response again. But we have to be careful about the definition of the impulse. What was an impulse? <coughs> an impulse is such a signal that if you multiply any signal, let's call this signal x of t, and let's multiply it with an impulse. The continuous time impulse is notated with an arrow and we should better indicate its magnitude. <coughs> but the magnitude is the area under the impulse. You remember that? It's not the height of this impulse. The height of the impulse is infinity. And the width is 0. But the area under it is 1. Let's assume that it's, uh, it's a particular value, tau, at a particular time, which is uh, indicated by tau. This one uh, produces what? It produces a new impulse, <coughs> the multiplication of x of t and that impulse. How can we notate that impulse, by the way? That impulse is delta t minus tau. You agree with that? It's an impulse at the position of tau. Uh, you can think of it like the delta t shifted towards right by an amount of tau. You can think of it that way, if you wish, from the definition. Or you can think of um, where the impulse is appearing. The impulse appears only when its uh, time index becomes zero. 
And when does it happen? When t is equal to tau. Because t minus tau then will become uh, zero. And at that point, we uh, encounter an impulse. So this impulse is at t is equal to tau. That's clear. So we want to determine now y of t, which is x of t times delta t minus tau, which is the multiplication of this arbitrary signal and this impulse. And the result will be, of course, another impulse. Right? That's true. It will be the, a, a similar impulse at the same position, tau. But its value will be different. What will the value be? Hmm? It's, it's not going to be 1 anymore. It will be 1 times whatever that value. It is xt at t is equal to tau. Therefore, it is x of tau. So let's write the value like this. It's a value. <coughs> and this is it. So what do we need to find this uh, value? How can we achieve this value? This y of t is still a signal. From that signal, we can extract the value of x of tau. But how? By only integrating. If we integrate this signal, if we integrate y of t all over the time axis, this new thing will be, of course, the integration of this uh, multiplication. This thing. And that will be the same as x of tau. So, as you see, an impulse is a sampler. It's like analog to digital conversion step. How do we apply a sampling from a continuous time signal? We multiply it uh, with, with an impulse at a particular time, so that we take the sample at that time. That's how we do it. Uh, but m after the multiplication, you need the integration to evaluate the value, to find the value. Okay. Now this thing <coughs> is therefore, uh, let me repeat here, x of t delta t minus tau dt is the same as x of tau delta t minus tau dt. And then this x of tau becomes a constant because it's this thing is only multiplying x of t at t is equal to tau. All the other values are multiplied by zero. Therefore, we can take this x of tau out of the integration. It's a value. It's not dt related thing. Minus infinity to infinity delta t minus tau dt. And here we get the area under an impulse, which is 1. Therefore, the the same equality becomes x of tau times 1, which is x of tau. That's why we have to integrate. This is uh, defining the impulse function. We define the impulse function like this. We don't I define it like becoming arbitrarily narrow and arbitrarily high so that the area underneath is 1. That definition is uh, not very much useful. We don't want that. The definition uh, that we require for an impulse is such a function that when it gets multiplied with any other function and integrated, it depicts the value at that uh, impulse position, which is tau. So uh, delta is such a function that this integral is equal to x of tau, in other words. <coughs> that is how we define the impulse. Now, that definition will let us uh, a convergence from a discrete time to a continuous time as follows. Remember that in discrete time we had this kind of a convolution sum. So we were representing uh, our signal x of n as a linear combination of shifted and scaled impulses. Now, a similar idea is valid for continuous time si signals as well. A continuous time signal 
can be represented as a linear combination of shifted and scaled impulses this time. But since uh, we are on the continuous axis, the summation becomes an integration. Here we have the scales, and the scales are the same as the values of the signal. Just like these xk's are the same as xn's at n is equal to k, sort of thing. So we, ha we need to have the same x here. But with a different parameter, this time this is the running index uh, in the discrete case, which is k. We need to find a separate variable again, lambda sort of thing, for example. But uh, as I said before, to stick with the notation of the book, let's call it tau. Tau is the t uh, in Greek letters, so they, they have some associations with t anyway. So this is x of tau, which, which is a value. And then at the end, we have to integrate for all taus. It's like summing up for all k's. And we need to put the impulses here. We need to uh, shift these impulses, shift to the position of tau, and scale with the value of x at that, at that uh, time instant, tau, x of tau, and then integrate. This is therefore our new formulation in continuous time. And notice the similarity. The summation becomes integration, that's it. And the variables become continuous variables of t and tau instead of n and k. Okay? Now, if you can uh, formulate the situation like this, then this idea of uh, input-output relation gives us the uh, impression that when delta t uh, comes in, h of t goes out. If delta t minus t prime comes in, what will go out? h of t minus t prime, because this is an LTI, linear and time invariant system. If it is a times delta t minus t prime that comes in, let me write it, comes into a system, what's the output? It is the same a times h of t minus t prime, in other words. So, uh, and you can always sum up at the left-hand side, and you can always sum up at the right-hand side. This summation, summing up, will be represented in terms of integrations this time. And that integration is this. Any x of t can be represented uh, as shifted and scaled impulses combined with an integration. And each individual impulse will generate the corresponding h. A delta t minus tau for a certain value of tau along this integration. Let's call tau is equal to t prime or 2 or 5.1. That will be an impulse which is inside the integral. And that particular impulse will produce h of t minus t prime. So what will this be? Uh, producing at the output of the system. What is the output then? Without any further analysis. By inspection, what can you say about y of t then? It is this integral. I'm asking in the form of the integral first. It is this integral, the same scale, because it's a linear system, if the impulse is scaled, the uh, h of t will also be scaled with the same value, which is x of tau. And every delta will produce the corresponding h. So this is the output then. And let's put it inside the third box. Because uh, it gives us the definition or the formulation of how to find uh, or evaluate the output once h of t is given to you. This is the formula. And this formula is notated in exactly the same way that we formulate or notate in discrete time. That is y of t is equal to x of t convolution h of t. Okay? This is the convolution formula. What was the convolution formula in discrete time? It was yn equals summation over k 
xk h n minus k this is integral over tau x tau ht minus tau so tau is k t is n all right so this is the uh, convolution now this convolution formula uh, cannot be evaluated uh, as we evaluate the output for the discrete time one by one impulse input and the corresponding output case. What did we do, uh, for example, how could you solve this quiz question? By the way, uh, those who entered later, this was the quiz question, so please write it in a piece of paper and uh, solve it while listening to me because you have to submit it at the end of the lecture, otherwise you'll be missing this class. Uh, how could we solve this? We could solve it like this. For each individual impulse in the in, in, uh, input signal, this h of n is produced. Then shifted and scaled version of the uh, response is also produced. A shifted version is also produced. A shifted version is also produced. And we add them up. That's possible. In continuous time, that is not possible because all the shifts are continuously incrementing. They are not incrementing, in other words, as one by one. So you may not combine uh, h of t minus tau for different tau values and then accumulate. That's not possible. The only possibility left for us uh, in, in the case of continuous time is the graphical or the geometrical interpretation of convolution. That's why we have learned uh, the convolution, uh, even in discrete time, the convolution as flipping around and sliding. Now that flipping around and sliding is proper, it's appropriate for continuous time. That is the method that you have to, you have to apply. You cannot find it in an, in an alternative way. Yeah, that's necessary. So the best way to explain that is by examples. Let's think of an x of t, an input signal like this which is a box, uh, it becomes 1 at 0 and stays as 1 and comes back to t uh, comes back to 0 at uh, t is equal to capital T this is the input and the impulse response is given as uh, a similar box with the same duration starting from 0 so this is h of t, the impulse response when I apply an impulse, this is what I get. And the value is, let's say, different. It is uh, 2, let's assume. It could be 1. It doesn't really change anything. So how do we convolve then? We convolve using the same strategy. We first flip around this signal to get <coughs> this time reversal and then we slide to the left and to the right the amount of uh, sliding or shifting towards left will correspond to the output to be evaluated at uh, negative time instances and as we proceed towards right it will be positive time instances so we have to uh, find y of t we are finding y of t for the particular value of t this corresponds to t is equal to zero no shift. If you shift towards left, will this make any overlap with x of t? No. They won't overlap. Okay. <coughs> if this shifts towards left. Therefore, it says that y of t for t is, equal, t is less than 0 is 0. It starts from 0 and onwards it goes. And how does it go? Um, when you slide slowly towards right, Let's assume that it has been shifted to the right by this much. How much? Let's call it t prime 
much shifted to the right. If it is T prime shifted to the right, what is the convolution output? That is, what is Y of T prime at that value? What is it? How do you find it? You find it in exactly the same way that we did for discrete time systems. You have to multiply this and this. And then, this time not a summation, not summing up, but integration. We need to find the area under the multiplication. That's what we need to do. So let's multiply this white shifted uh, shape with the uh, input x of t. What is the multiplication? The multiplication is starting from 0 and it goes up to t prime like this and it ends there after that these are zeros the zero values before that uh, this is, was zero so zero times this value two for example will make a zero one times two will make it two along this interval <coughs> after t prime it will come back to zero so this is the multiplication of x of tau and h of uh, t prime minus tau over the tau axis and we need to integrate this thing over the tau axis this was the formula for convolution as you remember the multiplication of this thing and that at uh, a particular amount of shift so what is the area under it Usu yeah, usually uh, rectangular or triangular uh, shapes are given for easy uh, area calculations. So this is a rectangular thing. It is 2 times t prime. In many cases, if t prime is somewhere like here or like here, then the output will be 2 uh, times t prime. So the more you shift towards right a little bit more or a little bit less, so you may choose the t prime here or t prime <coughs> here or here or here, uh, the answer doesn't change. It will be 2 times t prime. Until t prime becomes what? How much to the right can we shift? No, it, it, it's capital T. Yeah, <laughs> all right then. So uh, if you slide until capital T, then they will completely overlap. And over there, it will still be valid that uh, Y of T prime is equal to 2 T prime. But what happens after that? If you slide more than that, let's erase and think of a different situation. Here, what? It is supposed to be 2 because 2 times 1 is 2. The values are multiplied. If this is 3 and this is 2, then this would be 6. The value at the, those points must be multiplying the values at those points. Uh, in other words, the values after flipping this one around and sliding, whatever value you have there, value-wise, you have to multiply with the original. So the values were 2, therefore this is 2. It could be 1, it could be pi, then uh, it's just the multiplication, whatever it is. Let's slide it too much after flipping around, flipping this thing around, I have slided in such a way that it comes now to here. And this is my new T prime. What can you say now? What is the uh, multiplication of this and the original input X of T? Now the multiplication is a little bit different. Here uh, we start obtaining zeros somehow. And therefore the multiplication will start from this point. What is that point? We need to put a la legend to that label. And then 
it must go until not t prime anymore, but it is uh, capital T because cap t prime is more than capital T, and therefore it must go this much. So uh, this is again a rectangular box shape starting at where? What is this point? This point is t prime minus capital T, isn't it? The starting point. Because this is t prime, the width is capital T, therefore here is t prime minus capital T. So from t prime minus capital T to capital T, we have a box of height 2, and we need to find the area under it. So what is it? It is, the area is t minus, t prime minus capital T times 2. And it makes 2 capital T minus 2 T prime. Uh, it is 4, in fact. It's already 2, and uh, after multiplying with the 2, it becomes 4 capital T minus T prime. So this is the new area formula for us. How long is this formula valid? This formula is valid uh, as we push this thing towards right more and more and more and more. But at some point, uh, when T prime becomes 2T, two, 2 capital T, it will go down to zero and there will be no overlap afterwards. Now, can we just draw these uh, two shapes? Let me erase this part and let's give the answer here. So what is y of t? Let's notate it. It is equal to 0 when uh, t is less than 0, first of all. For the uh, slides towards left, it is all zeros. And it becomes 2t if t is greater than 0, but less than capital T. The, uh, along this much shift, it is increasing. Hmm? Yeah, we may put an equality at some point, but these are continuous uh, signals anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Let's put equality here. Because when t is equal to 0, 2t becomes 0, which is the same as this value here. Right? So it doesn't matter which one you choose. And then it starts declining. Uh, because the slide is more than uh, capital T, so it becomes decreasing. And the decreasing function is uh, 4 capital T minus 2T when T is greater than capital T, but less than uh, 2 capital T. Because if it is more than 2 capital T, then there will be no overlap. So it becomes 0 again when t is greater than or equal to, let's say, 2 capital T. Let's check what's going on at uh, t is equal to 2t, two, 2 capital T. If you insert a 2 capital T here, it will become 4 capital T. 4 capital T minus 4 capital T is 0. So it's the same as this value. If you just draw it, you will find the value to be uh, reaching to 2 capital T at capital T and then decreasing back to 0 at 2 capital T. This is the time axis and this is the output y of t. This shape you may expect, right? Because more and more are overlapping uh, and at the exact match they overlap at the peak, increase to peak, and afterwards the overlapping will decrease and decrease, and it will go down to zero, and it will stay zero after there is no overlap. This kind of uh, <coughs> graphical interpretation is uh, useful, and that's almost the only thing that you can do for uh, evaluating the uh, convolution or finding the output. We don't have any other method for convolution in continuous time. 
Okay. Now let's extend this example. By the way, the, the Java applets uh, for this one also uh, exist in the same page. How many of you guys have visited the Java applets and played around with the convolution? One only? <laughs> you should do that, right? Otherwise, um, you won't be exercising enough. For example, uh, by coincidence, you could have done this kind of a uh, convolution on the Java applet, then you know the answer. Or um, if you do two rectangles like this and convolve in continuous time, the continuous time Java applet also exists over there, you, uh, you will remember that the output looks like this. Or while drawing uh, with the mouse, uh, in that Java applet you again draw with the mouse and drag one of them after flipping around. You just slide it, you see how much overlap there is and what is the area under the uh, overlapping multiplication. That area will correspond to the value of the output then uh, you will see that it's quite difficult to have two rectangular shapes exactly at the same width. Okay? One of them will be a bit wider, probably. Now, what sort of a situation do we have? Suppose this is capital T1 and this is pi for x of t. And we have, this is capital T2, a different length. Let's assume it is shorter. And this value is 0 0.5, which is the impulse response. By the way, as you may guess, it doesn't really matter which one is x and which one is h. The commutative property of convolution is still valid here. So you may uh, flip around one of them and slide. This one or this one, whichever is more appropriate for you or easier. It will be the same thing. So let's flip around this one. H of T is flipped around. So it becomes a rectangle like this. And then we start sliding towards right. Because if you slide towards left, uh, there, there'll be no overlap with the top figure. But if you slide towards right, it will be this, and then this, and then this, etc. So as you slide uh, until uh, the slide amount is equal to T2, capital T2, it will uh, come inside this uh, overlapping region more and more. So the output, let's try to write it. It's equal to zero when t is less than uh, or equal to zero. Then you, sl you start sliding. How does it appear? The amount of slide is, let's say, uh, t1. Then what is the amount of overlap? This is t1. And the amount of overlap will be from zero to t1. From zero to t1, we need to multiply these two shapes and the multiplication of these two shapes will provide us with a level value. What is that level value? What is the multiplication of 0 0.5 and pi? It's pi over 2, 0 0.5 pi. So we will have a rectangle, the multiplication will be a new rectangle with the height 0 0.5 pi and the width is T1. T1. And uh, what's the area then? <coughs> pi T1 over 2 sort of thing. So let's write it like that. Pi t over 2. When t is greater than 0, but less than where? I, I mean, how, how much can we uh, insert into this box? Capital T2 much we can insert. After capital T2, there will be a different uh, overlap. This is valid until here. 
I'm pr uh, assuming that this capital T2 is less than capital T1. So this is longer and this is shorter. So that shorter thing is coming in. If that capital T2 is more, then the situation will be like this. Okay? The overlapping will be like this. This T1, this time index, is more than capital T2. Therefore, everything is inside the top uh, shape within the, uh, within the um, interval. So what is this uh, value that we have? It is T1 minus capital T2. So from T1 minus capital T2 to T1, there's an overlap. And the uh, overlap level value is still pi times uh, 0 0.5. What is the width of this thing? It is T2. So what is the area? Pi T2 over 2. If uh, T is greater than T2, but it must be less than uh, something else. What is that something else? When this T1 hits this capital T1, if you slide even more, then the right boundary will be bounded by th that top figure. Yep. So only within this limit between T2 and T1, T1 is larger, T2 is smaller, within that vicinity we have a constant value. Isn't it that a constant value? It doesn't depend on T. Pi times T2 over 2, it's just a value. And then afterwards, it starts decreasing. Suppose the, the new T1 is here. It is more than capital T1. <coughs> then the situation will be something like this. What is this uh, point here we have? It is T1 minus capital T2. But the multiplication will be only from T1 minus capital T2 up to capital T1 between here. And the level of the multiplication is again 0 0.5 times pi after the multiplication. From here to here, what is the area? It is equal to T1 minus, it's equal to T1 minus T, uh, capital T1 minus T1 minus capital T2 times pi over 2. And this will make T1 plus capital T1 plus capital T2 minus T1, the choice of the time variable, times pi over 2, which will be written here. It is pi over 2 times capital T1 plus capital T2 minus T. When T is greater than capital T1, but until some point where this, yeah, uh, this completely goes out. When does it completely go out? As long as you go uh, there, capital T1 plus capital T2, here you will be, uh, th this width will be capital T2, and this is already the capital T1. So if the time exceeds that point, there will be no overlap. So it is zero when T is greater than capital T1 plus capital T2. So it's a piecewise expression that we have. Let's try to plot that thing. It will be linearly increasing with t, with a slope of pi over 2, until capital T2. From 0 to capital T2, it's increasing. Uh, I am not happy with the labels. Let's do it like this, because capital T2 is a little bit longer than that. 
and the, the peak value that we achieve is can you tell me what this value is? the top value of this thing when t becomes capital T2 this is pi times capital T2 over 2 that is the peak value and notice that it stays at that value afterwards pi times capital T over 2 it stays uh, from T2 to T1 T1 is something larger than T2 let's assume it is here so until this point it stays the same va value and afterwards it decreases or declines at exactly the same uh, slope as the original 1 pi t over 2 thing until this point which is uh, t 2 plus t 1 uh, and at the value where t is equal to capital T1 plus capital T2 when this T is equal to capital T1 plus capital T2 this value becomes zero so it goes or, or it reaches down to zero at this edge and then it stays as zero afterwards and it was already zero here yes it's that one this one this value depends on T no it's uh, it's a function of T it, this is just a variable depending on the value of that t uh, this function is a function of time and it must produce a value we don't put a t inside the labels here otherwise uh, what can that value be? it depends on the value of the variable t when t is equal to t1 the value of the function is still pi capital T over 2 over 2 just substitute it here put uh, t is equal to t1 this t is equal to capital T1 therefore capital T1 plus capital T2 minus capital T1 will be capital T2 and pi uh, sorry uh, t1 uh, so uh, sorry it is pi excuse me about that it's pi times uh, t2 is remaining from here over 2 so that's the same value at this point at this point and at any point in between it's just like putting a value of 0 here of course it all depends on the value of t1 and t2 uh, we didn't mention any numerical value here now what I'm gonna do is this and I want you to do it uh, but uh, next week of course uh, I, I'm gonna do it as well meanwhile you should be studying you should be doing this uh, on the Java applet and you should also be doing this uh, on the paper to find the piecewise formulas like this how many pieces do we have we have five pieces similarly we should have several pieces how many pieces do we need first evaluate that for finding the answer to this question this is x of t which is uh, 1 from 0 to capital T whose value we don't know and this is h of t the impulse response which is up to 2 capital T and this is also 2 capital T so it's a ramp function increasing from 0 to 2t t with a slope of 1 over the time axis okay so what is the convolution output what is y of t you need to flip around one of these two 
Yeah. yeah, it's easier to flip around the XT, right? Because it's shorter, it's easier to uh, slide inside the longer one. But you could do the, the opposite way around as well. You could also flip around this thing and slide over here. So at some points it will be like this. At some other point it will be like this. At some other point it will be like this. At some other point it will be like this. So these are all sliding around, flipped around, and slided uh, ramp shapes like this. And every time you need to find the multiplication. And that multiplication will be, of course, the shape of a trapezoid. It's not going to be a constant value like here, because this is a varying value here. So how do you find the area under a trapezoid of this shape, for example? That's easy. That's easy. The, form the formulas you know. This height plus this height over 2 times this height. Sort of things. So work out this thing. Try to do it. And try to also see the result from the Java Atlas. Don't forget the Java Atlas. We will do that. We will continue with that next week.